Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. Tonight, I would like to put us into the Wayback Machine. We're going to way back to the mid seventh century in Korea. And we're going to join in with these, these two monks, two Buddhist monks, and they're on their way to uh, China. Because so they've decided that, you know, Buddhism in Korea is okay and all, but, you know, those guys in Tang Dynasty, China, they got it going on. Let's go there, see what we can pick up from them. So these two monks, Wei Zhang and Wan Yo, they're trudging along, they're going over mountains, they're going through valleys, trudging, trudging, trudging. They're going to take a ferry to China and they finally get to the dock and it's raining torrentially. It's ugly raining. The boat from the perfect storm is tossing around on the waves. The ferry was not going to take them to China that night. So they uh, decide, well, not going to walk back, so we better just find a place to crash for the evening. So they they find this cave, and they fall asleep, and they're sleeping and sleeping and sleeping and sleeping. And then in the middle of the night, Wan Hyo wakes up and decides, "Man, I'm really thirsty. Considering the amount of rain that I've gone through today." I'm really thirsty. So he reaches over, oh, there's this gourd-like thing and, and it has water in it. So it's dark and he's doing all this by feel, but you know, he, he drinks down the water from this gourd and best water he ever had. Couldn't beat that water. Best stuff ever. And then the sun comes up and they wake up the next morning and the sun is shining and the birds are singing and all is right with the world, except they find out, oh, that was a grave we slept in last night or a crypt, I suppose, would be more accurate. And that thing that I drank out of that had that most wonderful water in the world was actually a skull. And there were bits of brain and skin and other maggoty sorts of things in there. And yes, oh, I'm going to throw up. Yep, there I did. I threw up. And at that moment, Wan Yo had his... Uh, Great awakening, I guess you could say. And uh, we, uh, as a group here, have been looking at this particular book, which I don't know if you can see from there, but it's called Great Master Wan Yo. Uh, and it's written by Yong Jo Jong. And uh, I would like to read you just a little passage from it. Sleeping inside an underground shelter yesterday, I was at ease. But sleeping in a tomb last night, my mind was greatly agitated. Now I understand, when a thought arises, all dharmas, i.e. phenomena, arise. And when a thought disappears, the shelter and graveyard are one and the same. The three worlds exist simply in the mind, and all phenomena are mere perception. Since there is no dharma outside the mind, how can it be sought elsewhere? 
later on, he also condenses that down to, because one thought arises, all manner of phenomena arises. Because mind disappears, the shelter and the graveyard are no longer separate. So uh, if you know about Yogacara Buddhism at all, it's known as the mind-only school and an oversimplification uh, of the Yogacara ethos is uh, mind makes everything, right? So uh, it's misconstrued sometimes that, um, you know, everything is a figment of my imagination and you guys don't exist and this lamp doesn't exist and all that stuff doesn't exist. And that's really only part of the story there. Uh, the perception is what is the result of my thinking, right? So just because I perceive something as bad, to me, it's bad. Sleeping in a cave that I think is a cave, okay. Sleeping in a cave that I find out is a burial crypt, not so okay. The crypt slash cave didn't change any, didn't need my validation one way or the other to be good or bad, but it flopped from good to bad just because of my change in thinking about it. Now, one of the things that um, Korean Buddhism in general has, uh, Korean Zen or San, is uh, this notion of San and Kyo. And they're intermingled. They're perfectly compatible with each other. They are the front and back of the hand. and San is uh, the Korean word for Zen or meditation. And Kyo is study, scholarly pursuits. And in Korean Zen, that's absolutely compatible. And Wan Kyo, albeit not actually a uh, San master, was definitely in that vein of the scholar and practitioner. Uh, he wrote countless treatises on sutras and things like uh, Ashvagosa's Awakening of Faith in the Mahayana, uh, any number of things. He would write uh, treatises and, and commentaries on. And he was well known for being that scholarly kind of practitioner. And at one point or another, when he was off doing his um, travels, there came a time where, if I remember correctly, it was a king. And he wanted Wan Yo to stay over, and then the king's daughter and Wan Yo sort of had a liaison. And the next thing you know, uh, Wan Yo has broken his precepts. So he, I want to use the word disrobes, but that was the start of his problem, wasn't it? Dis, uh, defrocked. He's defrocked. And uh, so he, he lives the life of a layman. Now, one of the things that Wan Yo wrote was uh, a whole series of admonitions to the practitioner about upholding the precepts. And he was pretty strict about this, that the bodhisattva should adhere to the precepts for the sake of all beings. 
and he went through this uh, rather Nagarjuna-like uh, scenario where you're doing something with the best of motives, but it has a bad outcome, and it was a, a, a abiding by the precept, so it incurs this kind of karma, and if you did it with bad intent, but abided by the precept, and it had a good outcome, it had this other kind of karma, and he had this, this whole flow chart going on. Um, so he was serious about practitioners keeping the precepts. Obviously, uh, he slipped and had a son who also became a, uh, I think, Confucian scholar in his own right. But one of my favorite quotes from Wang Yo about this period is how can you save hell beings without being in hell? The suffering uh, being doesn't necessarily only exist on a little screen on a Zoom call and where everything is nice and contained and uh, predictable, let's say. It gets ugly out there. There are brothels and bars and the denizens of those things are also part of the all beings that the Bodhisattva vows to help and save. Wanyo's approach to all this was, you could say skillful means, like whatever it took to get the teachings of the Buddha to any person, regardless of their station in life, their occupation, their income, where they lived, didn't matter. Wan Yo was teaching the Buddha through his actions. And his actions were whatever was appropriate at that moment. Situation, relationship, function. If you're hanging out in a bar, there are things that you'll be able to talk about in a bar and a way that you'll be able to approach people and that will be different from a scenario like this. Doesn't matter. Saving all beings takes on all kinds of different uh, guises. So he did that. It, it was uh, referred to as Mu'an, which is without hindrance. So he wasn't attached to a rigid, strict adherence to the principles and the precepts just because he should be attached and adhere to them rigidly. That adherence, that attachment can be a real hindrance, right? So he would go out and in whatever way he needed to become unattached from whatever it might be that was being a hindrance so long as he could get the point across of the Buddha's teachings. There was another interesting aspect of, of Wang Hyo that originally uh, came to mind because of the Sangha we have here. Uh, tonight in attendance, we have a couple of us who are from the Five Mountain Order, which is in the lineage of Sun San, who was a uh, Korean monk who came over and uh, came over to the US, that is, and was teaching here. We have a couple of people that are in a Japanese tradition, Japanese Zen tradition. We have one of us who is not only 
uh, ordained in the Five Mountain Order. She grew up in Sri Lanka practicing Theravada and Vipassana meditation. And now she's even got a friend who's a Tibetan nun. So we've got that sort of pan Buddhist approach here where it doesn't really matter if it's a San Sangha or a Zen Sangha or a Chan Sangha or you sit and do Vipassana meditation only. It doesn't matter. We're doing the same thing here as Wanyo was, which was trying to spread the teachings of the Buddha to each other and other sentient beings in whatever way is required. I mean, a year and a half ago, we weren't doing this on Zoom, on Zoom, right? We weren't doing Zoom Zen. Uh, it, it was the situation. We had a relationship with Sangha members and this was how we did the function part. We needed to improvise. We needed to use technology that one can pretty safely say did not exist in Wan Yo's day. Although I wasn't there, so can't say for sure. But anyway, uh, I would like to think that we are, all of us, doing everything that we can through our practice and through our vows that we took as bodhisattvas, that we are actually doing whatever we can in whatever means necessary to save all beings.